<laughs> There's a few. Yeah. But you got till October 6th to do it all. Um, some of them are pretty quick, though. Some of the problems are pretty fast. I, I mean, you could probably tear through 20 in less than an hour on some of the parts of those assignments. Some of them not necessarily. Not, not all parts of the assignments. Some of them will be a little longer than the other. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Nope. Uh, yeah. In fact, I would I would not recommend doing them all at once unless you just really you know hate yourself or something. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're like that. I was never like that. I could never do that. But uh, yeah. I mean, I would probably recommend. What is there? there there's quite a few. Well, not on all of them. Okay. There's a lot on the first one. Um, yes, that one is 70 problems. You're right. But some of them are fast. Some of them are slow. Some of them aren't as fast, um, but some of them are smaller. I think like uh, the chapter two one's not as big, is it? See, it's only 30 something. Um, and that one's a little long, that was 50. But in this one's I think about 50. Yeah, 40, hey, it's only 40. So you figure, so, so you figure what, what is that, about 200 questions, but you got two weeks to do it. So that's 100 questions a week. Unless you would have started on Monday, then it would have been 100 questions over three weeks. But it's October 6th. Yeah. So what is that? But that's not so bad. That's only about, what, 15 questions a day? I thought that was only half No, so, so this is the fun part about statistics. Um, this is actually a course that we, I've taught over semesters, which are 15-week terms. And we just cram it all into 10. So we cover solid 10 to 11 chapters in 10 weeks in this class. So we really cram it in there, okay? So um, it's a lot of homework, I think. I'm not going to disagree with you on that. But it's, it's surmountable, I promise. Yes? Can you go over question 44? I sure can. Chapter 1? Yep. Question number 44. Let's make it happen. And, and as we go on, the assignments will get smaller because at the beginning, there's a whole lot of stuff, and it's not, not all of it's super substantive, but as we go on, the assignments will get smaller, I promise you, okay? They're not going to, like, stay at, like, a bajillion problems. Oh, but everyone's but, 34 isn't going to be the same. That's true, but they'll all be similar, okay? So, um, did I get the right one? Number 44. So, suppose that you are the president of the student government. You wish to conduct a survey to determine the student body's opinion regarding student services. The administration provides you a list of the names and phone numbers of 691 registered students. And, uh, discuss a procedure you could follow to obtain a simple random sample of five adults, or five students. So, um, which one of these apply? So the first one is number them 1 to 691 and use a random table to produce five different three-digit numbers. Corresponding name selected, would that work? Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Okay. So uh, we could number them up and use the random digit tables. Uh, list each name on a separate piece of paper. Place them all in a hat and pick five. Would that work? Yeah. That would work. It would be very time consuming. Okay, but you could do it. Um, ask the students to come to a meeting and pick five from those who come to the meeting. Is that a random sample? A lot of people say no. I tend to lean towards no, but why not? Why is that not random? How are you choosing the five? Well, yeah, it says here, what are we going to do? Well, it's not random because you chose the students to come to the meeting. Yeah. yeah, first off, we're asking them to come to a meeting. Okay. So, is that random? The people who show up, are those random people? Yeah, because then you get to choose the people that are in there, so you already choose them. Well, you're going to pick people. And the other, the other problem is that you, this is something we call, um, like, a voluntary response in the sense that uh, you're, not, you're not forcing people to respond. You're just saying, hey, you should show up to this meeting if you want to or don't if you don't, right? So uh, you're blocking out a whole lot of the students because what if you schedule the meeting during their class time? Or what if you schedule the meeting during the time they work? Or what if uh, you uh, don't offer any incentive to come, then the people who are going to come, it's like they must be really motivated to come talk to you for some reason, right? So it's a, it's a voluntary response. So that's not really random, okay? Uh, how about listing the names in alphabetical order and taking the first five? Is that random? That's not random. Um, it's systematic, and it might be an okay way to do it, but it's not random. Okay, so let's see if it likes it. Okay, um, 
and then now go ahead and do it on the random table provided. Start with the first column and the first row, work down each column. So they're going to give us a random table, and they just want us to start up here. So notice we only have 691 people, right? So we're going to have the first three-digit number is 781. That doesn't work for us. We don't have 781 people. So we just keep going. 728, we don't have that many people. The next one is 073. And so we can keep that one. So uh, student 73 is in, right? Uh, the next one is 818. We don't have 818 students. And so I'm just reading left to right. And then 092, we have a 92. After 092 is 315, we have a 315. We have 315 students. The next one is 739, but that's too big, right? Uh, 667, we have one of those. And then the last one, let's see, is going to be, looks like it's going to be 225. And did I get five people? Yeah. yeah, okay. So yours may be just a little different. You might have a slightly different iteration. But you're just reading three digits at a time across that table from top to bottom until you get five numbers that fit in your sample. Is okay. it three digits? It has to be three digits because we have our sample sizes in the hundreds, or our populations in the hundreds. So like yesterday in the example I did in class, I only used two digits because I was picking from a class of like 34, right? So I don't need three digits if I'm only picking from 34 people. I only need two digits. Oh, okay. But since this is in the hundreds, I need three. And I think it'll take it like this. I don't know if it's going to want the zeros in front of those two-digit numbers, but I doubt it. Oh, no, it doesn't. So I think it might want to. Uh, I put the zeros in front of it, and it says it was wrong. I don't like it. Well, let's see. Let's see if it doesn't like it my, this way, and then we'll, um, and then we'll, we'll see. So let's check that first. So start with the first column of the first row. Work down. Oh, they want you to work down. Why would they want you to work down? Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm going to follow their instructions. That's not how I've ever used this table random digits, but that's the way we want us to. It actually doesn't matter because it's random, right? So they want us to go three digits and work our way down. So 781's not, and they want to, so then they want us to go down to 180, I guess. So let's try this. Let's try it their way. So 180... Uh, 966, 702 is not in, uh, 92 is in, let's see, uh, 172 would be in, because they're in our size, uh, 39 would be in, 660 would actually make it in too, wouldn't they? Um, so let's try that. Okay, whew, liked it that time. So apparently I taught you wrong yesterday. Sorry. Um, that's not how I've ever read a table of random digits. I've always read it across, but you can read it down. It really doesn't actually matter because they're random. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's all. They just read format a little, but all the help is in this menu right here. So you just hit question help, and uh, you can view an example, and they'll walk you through. Um, how to solve a similar problem, right? So they're showing you how to pick the digits. Uh, they show you how they walk through a table to get their sample, okay? So you can do that as well. So they have videos. Sometimes they're cool and sometimes they're lame. Let's see if this one's good. Sometimes they're really annoying. Oh, look, they're going to use a calculator. Don't use that one. <laughs> I don't know. They have little, little fun little videos where they'll walk you through. Maybe. So, oh, now they're using, yeah, they're also using a, uh, show you how you stack crunch to it, but anyways, yeah, the best one, the view and example is probably the best because it gives you really similar problems. Okay, let's walk you through it. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, any other questions from the homework? Yeah, I think that was probably the issue, maybe that you were running one way and we were supposed to be running down apparently, which was my fault because I taught you wrong. Sorry. Well, it's true. There is not. You can't possibly read the table incorrectly, actually. There's no way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a question that I haven't really gone over it yet, but um, how do you, I think it was like question like three or two. Or, um, on the first homework? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how to copy and paste the people. Oh, yeah, on the stack crunch? Yeah. I couldn't do, I didn't know how to do it either. <coughs> mm -mm. On this one, or was it a different one? It was, a, it was like towards the beginning, and it wanted you to use stack crunch and mm -hmm. Was it, are you, was it, are you sure it was the first homework? Yeah, yeah. it was like literally one or two or three. Uh, I think that was the orientation. 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 
Oh, on the orientation assignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Orient on the orientation assignment. Yeah. Oh, they gave you a stat crunch one. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. A data set, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is this is something, um, actually, it's, it's, it's easier than you think. You actually don't have to copy-paste it. You see this little icon right here? If you click on that icon, it actually lets you, it says, one of the options is open in StackCrunch. So, so rather than do a copy-paste, you can actually just uh, open it straight into StackCrunch, and then it will... Uh, It'll just pull that data up in StackCrunch. Right there. Okay, so this is something we're going to get a little bit more into in Chapter 3, but there is uh, the way that you can do that is in, uh, there's a menu called stat, Summary Stats, which we're going to use pretty extensively in Chapter 3. And so uh, it's Summary Statistics for our data in columns. So when you click that open, it gives you like a bajillion things you can calculate with those numbers, but one of the options is the sum. Yeah. And if you uh, compute that, oh, yeah, you so, so our variables are all in var1 for sum. You can compute that, and then boom. It's just that's your answer there. So, yeah. But, yeah, it's right here. Stat, summary, stats, columns. Yeah, there is, um, if you, there, I don't know if they have a, they don't have that one. There is a video, if you want, on this, uh, videos and tutorials. If you scroll down to StatCrunch, you can, that calculating descriptive statistics video, um, that'll also walk you through the steps in case you didn't catch it or write it down just now, just so you know. You can watch that little tutorial. It'll show you how to do it. Okay. But yeah, there should, there's always, anytime they give you data tables, there's always that little blue icon that you just like click on and say open in stack around, it'll pull it up for you. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. So there will be some bumps along the way probably getting used to using stack crunch or my stat lab, but they should hopefully all even themselves out. Okay. We'll see where we're at in a week or two. All right. If it's just like, you know, soul crushing. My goal is not to break you, I promise. Okay. <laughs> so, I can be reasonable, I promise. All right, any other questions? No? So, in case you haven't got started, you might want to. All right. Um, and we're going to be, because we're going to actually be done with Chapter 1 today, and we'll be getting into Chapter 2. So, I mean, I would make it a goal at least to be done with the Chapter 1 homework by the end of this weekend. That would probably be a good goal to have. Um, so, all right. So, if no more questions, we'll move on, finish out chapter one, okay? So, we were talking exactly about taking samples yesterday when we left off. Um, we talked about the idea of simple random samples, and that's where we came up with that table of random digits, which I incorrectly showed you how to use, apparently. So, just read it down the columns from now on and forget everything I said, I guess. Um, that's okay. So, uh, and then I showed you how to do it on StatCrunch. Then we were, what we were talking about yesterday was some ideas that were not random, but, ne but actually had some merit to them. So uh, the stratified sampling was when you split your population into groups, and you're just going to take a sample from each group. And we talked about some advantages of that. Uh, it kind of guarantees diversity in your sample uh, if you have a diverse population. But um, it's pretty time consuming. We talked about systematic, so that's where you pick people by a pattern. Um, or maybe a grid or something, okay? It's not random at all, but it could be a pretty good plan, especially if you're trying to cover a spatial area, right? Um, okay, so uh, another way that we'll do sometimes, and it depends on the circumstances, is what's called cluster sampling. And uh, cluster sampling is a lot like stratified, or at least it starts like stratified. So when you're doing a cluster sample, you're again going to split your population into groups. Uh, based on some sort of 
some variable. Okay, so in um, in stratified sampling, right, you would go and you would go into every single group and you'd, you'd take a few individuals to observe in each of those groups. In cluster sampling, it handles it a little differently. Rather than going into every single group, you just uh, randomly select groups. And I'll just say sum of the groups. Okay, so you don't pick, you don't actually go to every single group, you just go to a few. And, um, and then within there, you sample everybody in those selected groups. All right, so it's just a little bit different. So rather than going to every single group and having to track down a few people, then now you're just going to pick a couple different groups, go to those groups, and just talk to everybody or get an entire uh, representative sample of those people. All right? So there still is some randomness in that you randomly select the groups. Okay. Uh, what could you imagine would be some disadvantages of a strategy like this, though? What do you think? Yeah, so you're de you're you're potentially leaving out some important groups, right? So you're you're missing data from entire groups potentially. It's very possible. Um, yeah, that's the biggest problem. Um, what do you think an advantage of this is? Any advantages to something like this? Yeah, it can be really easy. Uh, an example I've given for this in the past is like, imagine as a, uh, a math department, right? We decide we want, we're considering using um, a new format of exams or something, right? Well, uh, we have classes all over the spectrum from developmental to college level to calculus to differential equations and linear algebra. And so, um, you know, we could potentially think, okay, well, we think maybe different uh, levels of math are going to handle this differently. So we could go into every single classroom and randomly select a few students to take our new test format, right? We could do that, but that's going to be really difficult. That would be a stratified sample, but it's going to be hard because then I'm going to have to go into every classroom and get every teacher to give a couple students just a different type of format of test. But what would be a lot easier is if we just randomly selected a few classes throughout our department and just switched over the whole class to that new format, right? That would be a whole lot easier. So that would be a cluster sample. Um, so sometimes it's a lot easier, but the problem is, is then you, you risk missing something, right? Maybe I just end up with uh, no stats classes in my sample, right? It's possible. Okay, kind of make sense? Yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll give you an, so let's look at an example, and you tell me how you would do it. So suppose uh, city of Richland it wants to know if a majority of the residents in neighborhoods around the city are satisfied with trash and recycling collection services. S design a systematic sampling approach. To answer this question, how would you do this in a how could you do it in a systematic fashion? Okay, so how are but how are you going to pick who to talk to? In a system, how would you do it systematically? Like neighborhoods or streets? How are you going to pick them though? Every second house yeah. on every street. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to be surveying. Um, for probably the next 10 years, but that's okay. You're going to get some good data. You could do it that way. So sure. Yeah. I mean, you could I, personally, I, I'm not really, uh, prone to, um, I'm not very excited about doing this, but you could, and it would be systematic. Absolutely. Just start on every single street and then just go to every other house. And, um, by the end of it, just hate yourself. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, so we're going to get there. I was just thinking, is there any other ways you could think of to define it uh, systematically? Yeah. Just like every third street or fifth street? Yeah, so you could go, um, that would get a little complicated because uh, not all our streets run east, west, north, south. Uh, so what about streets that like bend around and run into each other? But yeah, you could somehow uh, come up with some way to pick every other street or something. 
and then just try to go, or every three streets or something, and try to go down all those streets and get everybody? Yeah, I think so. So uh, uh, pick every, what did you say, third street? Yeah. Sure. That's still going to be pretty time consuming, but you're going to get a lot of data. Yeah? Uh, could you just like uh, set those neighborhoods and just say like as a regular one of this many houses in this particular neighborhood? That sounds like a different type of sampling approach, actually. That, that doesn't necessarily sound like a systematic-ish, unless you're going to somehow make all your neighborhoods the same size or something. Yeah. Anyways, I think, those, I think those are totally good examples. I was thinking you could just grid up the map, right, and just put a grid over the map of Richland, and then just at all the intersections, just go pick up the house that's at that intersection or something. But uh, any, any of that stuff will work, okay? Um, there's probably some better ways to do it. I don't think systematic is the best way to do it. Um, what if we were going to do it stratified, and this might be getting back to what you were saying, right? I'm not sure. I don't know where it's at. I think in class four, I remember having similar questions and something like that. I had to do with, like, um, how many people had, like, pools or something in their mm -hmm. yards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So take a map and kind of roughly draw neighborhoods, yeah. right? And say this is neighborhood one, this is neighborhood two, this is neighborhood seventeen, right? And then you just go into every single neighborhood, and then you just randomly select. Um, I don't know. Probably don't need that many say 10 homes or something yeah. from each neighborhood, right? You say, this is neighborhood one, I'm going to go get 10 people from there. This is neighborhood two, I'm going to go get 10 people from there. This is neighborhood three, I'm going to go get 10 people from there, right? So that would be a stratified approach, yeah. So really not, it's not a bad idea, actually, okay? You're going to be doing a lot of driving because you're going to have to go all over the city. But, uh, you know, Richmond's not that big, so not too bad, right? Can you just mail some to their houses? Now, that... You run into problems, though. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, because, I mean, if, I'm, if the city mails you something, are you, how likely are you actually to respond to that? Right? Unless it's a bill or a check, I'm not opening my mail. Right? <laughs> and even if it's bills, I hardly open those. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It depends how much money you have. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but then you're paying four people. So, yeah, normally these things are limited by budget. I mean, that's pretty much all sampling designs. They're all limited by budget in real life. It's how many people can you pay, and how much time can you pay them for. And anyways, yeah. So, so a stratified approach actually would be pretty good. It would work pretty well, I think. Um, could you do it as a cluster though? Could you think about a cluster? How would you do it as a cluster sample instead? Yeah, so you could uh, you could sp you could split again by neighborhood or street or something. So split city by uh, I'll say neighborhoods or streets. Probably neighborhoods is a little easier to do, but you could do it by streets only because streets are different lengths. So it might be easier just to draw geographical neighborhoods. Um, and then from there, you would just uh, pick a few neighborhoods. And within those neighborhoods, if it's cluster, what would you have to do within those neighbor those few neighborhoods you pick? Yeah, you would basically have to blanket the neighborhood, right? And you would have to do your best to uh, basically talk to everybody. Okay. So could you like split them up in like uh, high income neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods? Well, if you were randomly selecting, you would uh, you would assume the randomness would give you that. Uh, you would end up with some higher income and some lower income neighborhoods. Uh, the problem with cluster is exactly what we're talking about, though, is it's potential. there's a potential that your random assignment might not actually get a good diversity. You know, you might end up with four neighborhoods all side by side just by random chance. It's not likely, but it could happen. Uh, and that's why, we, that's why stratified has advantages. Yeah, so. 
Uh, this one could be tough, I mean, because you're having to go through the entire neighborhood. But at least you don't have to be driving all over the city, right? Uh, for cities in the tri cities not too hard because they're not too big. But you can imagine if you had a much bigger city, that would be a pain. Um, what do you think? So which one would you rather do? What do you think is the best? Stratified. Stratified, I think, for especially for a smaller city, would be the easiest. Um, because going from neighborhood to neighborhood is not that hard. Um, and you, that way you guarantee some diversity. You're making sure you're getting stuff from every single um, from every single neighborhood. Although the systematic wouldn't be too bad, I don't think. Um, as long as you didn't overwhelm yourself with too many houses to visit. Okay. So, anyways. So you can see there's just advantages and disadvantages to all the strategies. All right? Cool. So, uh, the problem, though, and this is kind of what we were getting at when we were talking about random selection or sending out mail, is you really need what you're really trying to do when you're introducing this um, uh, random selection is you're trying to eliminate bias. Okay. Uh, so bias happens when your sample is not representative of the population. Okay, so anytime something happens in your sampling procedure or in your data collection that makes it so that the data you end up collecting doesn't actually represent your population, then you have a problem with bias. Okay? It means that someone's overrepresented or underrepresented or something about the way you ask questions cause them to answer in ways they don't really agree with necessarily if you ask them in an unbiased way. Okay? And so uh, randomness is really trying to tackle bias. That's the idea, at least. Okay, so bias is, is really pretty bad. Um, but and there's basically two types. There's two types of bias. There's bias that comes from sampling bias. Okay, so uh, sampling bias occurs when um, the procedure or the method you use for uh, selecting individuals causes bias. So it's like something you did as the designer. So I'll write in parentheses, it's your fault. Or mine, if I'm taking the samples, right? So sampling bias means you did something that caused your sample to be unrepresentative of the population. So you could have, it, it could have been avoided. <coughs> All right? So um, examples of sampling bias would be things like um, taking non-random samples. Uh, we have something called a convenience sample. Right? So uh, if the question is, if someone comes to me and says, hey, Ryan, um, I'd really like to know uh, what percent of students are satisfied with, um, you know, the whatever graduation requirements at CBC or how, apply, how to apply to graduation or CBC or something. And I just say, uh, okay, hey, cool. I have uh, 150 students that have to do things that I say they have to do if they want credit, so I'm just going to all give them an assignment to fill out this survey, right? That's really convenient to me, except for uh, why would that be a bad idea? Because oh. I'm not going to take the survey seriously. Uh, but what if I tell you you can have 500 extra credit points take the to take the survey? How do you know I take it seriously? How do you know I well, I don't, but how do I know anybody takes the survey seriously right, when I give it? You're not supposed to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, but but what's the problem if I just only sample my students and say, "Hey, here we go." What about right. students that don't have to take steps? Right. So if I only sample you, and I say, "Hey, everybody gets 500 extra credit points if you take the survey," and you have to take it seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, you're just not represented as CBC students, right? Necessarily, because. Um, uh, stats tends to be 
has students that have different tracks or different, um, you know, end goals than other classes, right? So, anyways, that's a convenient sample. So, convenient sampling is bad, right? Okay, so these are things to be thinking about as you're counting trucks this weekend, right? It's okay if you make convenient samples, but, you know, at least now you might recognize it if you do it. All right, um, non-random samples are bad. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything. There are things like, uh, like, especially in surveys, the way you can, what happened here? I think I broke my pen here. Oh, man, this is going to be interesting. What do you think? Did I put the battery in backwards? My battery came out. Let's see if this works. I can try to draw with a pen. That would not be good. Ah, there we go. Um, there's you could have poorly worded questions in surveys, right? Okay. So if you word a question that elicits a certain response, um, then that would be you know. Uh, then, then you're actually, people might actually feel differently if you wouldn't have worded the question in a certain way. So, anyways. Okay, so th these are things that you do wrong that cause bias. But um, there's a lot of other things that you can't really control, okay? So uh, one way is that non-response or uh, sometimes you have voluntary response. So this is uh, the problem that we're talking about, actually that we were just talking about, right? So you just say, I give everybody a survey, and then you just say, uh, screw you, you're not giving me credit for this, I'm not gonna take it. Or you say, I'm just gonna fill in C from top to bottom, and good luck, yeah, right? So that like. doesn't look like it, right? So, uh, so in non-response, right, so uh, individuals just don't respond. So, um, you could design, I could design the most perfect sample. I could get every single CBC student on a big list and I could randomly select 35 of them. But the problem is, is that uh, seven of those people might just not want to talk to me. Okay. And uh, why do you think that could introduce bias? Because you're not getting the people who don't want to participate's answers. You're only getting people who want to. Yeah, and maybe there's something about people that don't want to participate that's different than people who do want to participate. And maybe I'm interested because you're still a student here. I still want to know what you think, okay? And uh, you're an important population, but you're just one of those people that doesn't like participate in surveys, okay? That could, but uh, something about those two populations could be different. All right? So non-response is a problem. Even So this is, uh, this is an example of, um, oh, I meant to write on that last slide. This is an example of a non-sampling error, right? You can't control this as the as the administrator of the study. Okay. Um, <clears throat> response bias. This is also a non-sampling error. Okay. Uh, and this is essentially when uh, individuals lie. or uh, potentially misunderstand, you know. So basically, you get responses that aren't actually true or don't actually represent how people feel, but the reason is is because they're either lying to you or they just misunderstood um, and they thought they were answering something and they weren't actually answering it that. Uh, you see this a lot in um, studies that are looking at, say, like, illicit drug activity, right? So even if it's an anonymous survey, people just like don't like to admit that they're doing illegal drugs, okay? Um, for whatever reason, so it's underrepresented. Um, anyways, you see it a lot in those types of studies, okay? So response bias is a problem. So there's all sorts of things that can creep in. Uh, we have ways to control for them, but they're there anyways, all right? Um, so the, the sampling versus the non-sampling, right? So the sampling errors are basically your fault, right? And all those other non-sampling errors, 
These are uh, out of your control. You can try to control them. So I can try to control non-response by offering you extra credit, right? So that's one way I can try to encourage you to participate. I can try to encourage you not to lie by telling you, I don't know, showing you a video on ethics or something. I don't know how to do I don't know what I would do. All right? Okay? But anyways. Okay? So. All right. Cool. So um, most of those we're talking about, there, those are observational studies, um, though there could be bias in experiments. So I want the last section in Chapter 1 just spends a little bit more time talking about um, experimental design. Okay, so I just want to go through some of the vocabulary they use. So um, we use the term factors. These are variables um, which are believed to uh, affect your response. Okay, so um, we talked about explanatory variables, but sometimes you might think there's multiple explanatory variables. So those different explanatory variables are what we call factors. Okay, and the treatments are any combination of factors. Okay. So, as an example, okay, uh, I might be doing a study, okay, and I might be doing, I might be interested in um, something like uh, maybe some factors I think are going to affect your, um, I don't know, we'll say maybe I think uh, gender might be a factor in how someone responds to a treatment and maybe their age is going to be a factor in how they respond to treatment, right? So maybe a gender I split into male, female, and maybe age I split into like young, middle age, old, right? But in an experiment, I might be, my treatments would actually be combinations of these different uh, things. So you could be a male who's young, you could be a male who's middle aged and you could be a male who's older, or you could be a female who's young, a female who's middle aged, or a female who's older, right? So the factors are the things you actually think are affecting them, but the treatments are the different levels that you match up, if that makes sense. It's like you kind of see the difference. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, the experimental unit, this is basically the smallest scale that treatments are applied to. They give some examples of this in your book, which you could read. Um, the experimental unit, it, it's sometimes individuals. So, like, in clinical trials, the experimental units are just people because each person is getting a different level of treatment. But sometimes we can't go on such a fine level. So, like, for example, if you were doing, um, if you were doing research like in agriculture, for example, and suppose you were looking at how maybe fertilizer type and water levels affected crop yield. Okay, so you have two factors and different levels of those factors. The problem is, is that uh, if you're talking about like corn or something, you can't go into a cornfield and just like randomly select corn stalks to give a certain amount of water and a certain amount of fertilizer, right? You would just have to apply that amount of fertilizer and that amount of water on uh, plots. So your experimental units would actually be plots, not uh, corn stalks, for example, if that makes sense, okay? So it's like, what's the smallest level you're applying to? And then the subjects are just the individuals. It's just another name for individuals and experiments, okay? All right. Um, in uh, this, in experiments, it's always really important to have control groups. So uh, a control group, that's a group 
which receives no treatment. Okay. And um, why is it important to have control groups in experiments? Yeah, it, it serves as a baseline, and it's because otherwise you could have trouble knowing if you are effective. I mean, if you give everybody the drug, so say you're testing like um, some sort of, maybe you're testing some sort of like weight loss drug or something, and you just give everybody the weight loss drug, and then on average your participants lose weight. Well, does that necessarily mean that it was because they were taking the drug? How do you know, right? How do you know it's just not because they're participating in a weight loss clinical trial and maybe they're more conscious of their decisions to or whatever or maybe they decide hey I'm in this I'm gonna maybe start exercising or eating a little better or something like that right so things like that could happen um, so you want to have that control group to make sure that when you see results you can actually compare them because it's possible if you split them up and you said hey you know you gave these guys placebos and these guys the drug and then they might both lose weight and then it's like okay so actually the drug wasn't really the effect the effect was enrolling them in this clinical trial that's what actually caused them to lose weight so you have to have that control group. Um, control groups are really easy to design when you're dealing with like animals or plants or machines because uh, they don't really know whether or not they're getting treatment. But humans, uh, we're a little bit more, um, I don't know, hard to please or we're very strange. Okay. Uh, so what is a placebo? Yeah, I mean, it's basically, it's, uh, it's a, it's a non-treatment. Right? It's a non treatment which is uh, disguised as a treatment, right? I mean, I think we all know what a placebo is. I totally just made that definition up. Okay? But I think everybody knows what a placebo is. It's basically like you're going to give me a pill and you're going to tell me that I'm receiving a pill, but you're not going to actually tell me whether it has the drug in it or not. You're just going to say, hey, here's your pill. Thanks for participating and go on your merry way, okay? So why are placebos, why do we always have a placebo in our trials if it involves uh, humans? Could lie. Yeah, because if you go into a, a trial and um, it's for like pain relief or something, right? And they say, uh, and then you say, okay, hey, thanks for participating in our thing. Um, you know, and then all these people go over there and they get pills, and then all these people come over here and they don't give you a pill, and then they ask you an hour later, hey, how's your pain? What are you going to say? You're going to be like, it's exactly the same. You didn't give me anything, right? Okay, so they're more likely to report non-effects. Um, and when we have, when people give us pills, like for some reason, like we just feel better about it, right? So humans are weird, okay? You know, so... The placebo effect is very real and it's very measured. So we're just not that smart, I guess, or something. I don't know. Sometimes we think we're smarter than we are. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you have humans, we always use a placebo. And it's not a bad idea. Uh, the placebo is actually an example of a blind. Um, and so a single blind happens when, um, sorry, the recipient of the treatment is unaware if uh, getting the treatment or the um, placebo. Okay, so. Single blind means the person who's getting the treatment doesn't know. So that's you. So you come in here, I give you a shot, and I'm not going to tell you whether it's medicine or it's, uh, you know, salt water. So, okay, go on. Um, if that's a single blind, what do you think a double blind is? When both the recipient and the researcher do not know whether it's therapy. Yeah, so the person, so then that's the, um, that's when either the recipient nor the administer 
the minister, stir, doesn't matter, minister of treatment is aware. So why is that important? Because you get uh, no research bias. Right. So how could you imagine knowing whether someone was getting a treatment or not would affect you? Say, so say, you're, say you're, uh, you're the nurse and you're participating in a clinical trial. You're the one who's actually giving the pills and then recording patient responses. Uh, how could knowing whether or not they were getting affect your, uh, you as the nurse? You could. You could. Yeah, I mean, you could, if you know they're getting a treatment or know they're not getting a treatment, you know, you could just lie and be like, dude, they're not giving this person a pill. I'm just going to say that, blah, 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 right? What else? You could be influenced in your findings, uh, maybe pay more attention to things with certain people and less with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you might be more likely to, to try to pinpoint pain or something or this or that or really pry for side effects or really pry for something like that. So uh, this way it guarantees that neither the recipient's reporting it nor the person recording it has any sort of bias in the thing. And, and hopefully, uh, obviously, somebody somewhere knows, right? It's just not anybody that's face-to-face uh, -face with the uh, patients, okay? So it's a pretty good idea. It's pretty, sta pretty standard practice in clinical trials. All right? Cool. Lots of vocabulary. <coughs> so go back to this... Um, Go back to this study that we were talking about earlier. You have these pregnant women. They're going to be given folic acid or not. And um, they looked at birth defect rates. As far as it's written, what's the only factor that we're actually looking at here? Yeah, right now we're only looking at uh, the only factor is folic acid, right? Um, and then I can't remember if I did a treatment thing. So I didn't. And then from the treatments, so that would be your factor, you would, you would still have two treatments, right? Your treatments would either be uh, the folic acid or placebo, right? So your factor is folic acid, but your treatment still has two levels. Um, did, was there any control group? Yeah, the ones that got the placebo. Right, so, um, so the women not receiving folic acid, they made sure not to. Right, so they were our control group. Uh, did they use any blinds? I don't know. Did I even mention it in the problem setup? I didn't really even mention it, but they probably did. I mean, if they're giving placebos, then that means that there's at least a single blind, right? Um, I, did, I didn't mention whether or not they had a double blind on or anything like that. But a placebo means you're doing at least a single blind. All right. Cool. Right on. So the last thing I want to mention here, and this is going to finish out chapter one right on time, is um, there's basically, there's, there's a couple types of ways you can design experiments, um, and it really depends on how your, uh, how your population is set up. So the most common way and the most easy way to do it is what we call a completely randomized design. And um, in a completely randomized design, all you do is you take your sample and you split them into a treatment, a treatment group and a control group, okay? And then you just observe what happens and you compare, okay? So it's just like, I got 4,500 women here. I'm gonna, sit in, I'm gonna randomly select 2,250 to go over there. I'm gonna randomly select 2,250 to go over there. You get the treatment, you get the placebo, let's see what happens, okay? That's a completely randomized design. We didn't try to control for any variables, anything like that, okay? Hopefully the randomness is gonna take care of some of those lurking variables, and then we're just gonna call it good to go. Um, sometimes though, there's better ways to do it. Uh, what we'll do, sometimes what we'll, they'll do is you'll take your population, okay? And what you'll do is you'll split people into pairs. <coughs> you know, pair N or whatever. You split, you start splitting people into pairs. Um, and you split them into pairs based on the fact that they share a lot of things in common. 
So maybe you try to match people as closely to someone their age, their weight with their family history or something like that, or their age who smoke or don't smoke with their family history. So you match people up as closely as possible. Then within each pair, you give the treatment, the control, the treatment and the control, right? And then at the end, you compare. Right. And, uh, and, and sometimes actually, um, people can serve as their own pair. So sometimes you'll see in experiments where they'll observe people, uh, they'll like split it half and half where like for the first half you're taking a placebo or a treatment and then the second half you're, t you're, d you switch off to the placebo or the treatment and then they just compare people's responses to each other. Okay, so sometimes you can serve as your own treatment. Sometimes you get matched up with someone else who's considered very similar to you. Okay, that's a matched pairs design. What's the advantage of matched pairs? What's it trying to control for? Large differences in the people. Yeah, so what it does is it makes sure that then basically you know that at least all of those factors are taken into account because you know you have some people out there who are a certain age uh, with a certain uh, genetic background that are getting the treatment in the placebo, right? Okay. <coughs> uh, so matched pairs is pretty good. Uh, the other way to do that if matched pairs isn't feasible is what's called a randomized block design. And it's kind of similar, but a little more general. From your population, you split your population into groups based on lurking variables or factors. <coughs> so here, um, it's kind of like stratified sampling, sort of. You split them into groups and uh, based on some lurking variable. So this could be, this could be split them into maybe age groups, right? And you say everyone who's under 30 go over here, everyone who's 30 to 50 go here, and everyone who's over 50 go over there. And then within each group, you split between treatment and control. <coughs> right? And then at the end, you compare everyone. So what's, what's the advantage of doing it this way? Uh, could be, could be. Uh, I don't know if it'd be much more quicker than just a randomized, completely randomized design. Well, it'd be quicker than just like actually pair them off. It's definitely quicker than match pairs. Yeah, it's easier than match pairs because you don't have to worry about trying to match people up. Uh, what else? How so? How so? Yeah, so, so the nice thing here is you can look at it, you can actually look at these two ways in hindsight after you finish your trial because you could combine everyone back into one big data set, all the treatments and all the controls, and just see how, where people affected overall. But then you can also go in to each group separately and see how the treatment affected the groups differently. You know, you might find overall that the drug wasn't that effective, but then when you go in and you look at group three, all the people over 50, maybe it was extremely effective. Or maybe it wasn't effective at all in that group, but it was very effective in the young people or something. Right? Yeah. And com compares the population, yeah. So then that tells you a few things because if you're like a doctor, it tells you first off, is this work for the general population? And then beyond that, does it actually work better for certain groups of people than others? So it gives you a lot more information. Uh, it's pretty good practice. It's a little harder. It takes a little bit more upfront work. But uh, in, in general, it's a really good way to go. All right. So we are out of time. We're about a day behind, but that's okay. Uh, we'll pick up there on Monday, and um, definitely try to get through homework one this weekend if you can, okay?